Uh, good morning to those of you who are here. Welcome. And it looks like people are still filing in. I see that number going up. So uh, my name is Franny and um, I'm your host of Liquid Margins. Welcome to the fourth episode of Liquid Margins. Today it's called Experimenting on the Margins, Annotating Science. I'd like to introduce our guests now. We have Allison Colazar from Colgate University and Jennifer Blake Mahmood from also from Colgate University and then Jeremy Dean not from Colgate University but from Hypothesis um, and with that I'm gonna let Jeremy take it away thanks hi everybody I'm super excited to be part of this conversation um, my parents work at the National Institutes of Health. I have uh, a brother who is a, a PhD uh, in neuroscience, a sister is an MD, and uh, she works in the emergency room at Mass General. My little brother majored in chemistry in college, and my wife is a PhD in uh, animal behavior. Uh, but I am a PhD in English. I'm a humanist. Um, and so I'm out of my league here. I'm, uh, you know, I come from a discipline where close reading of text um, is, is, you know, the foundation of the discipline of, of English and literary studies. Um, and so I've always, and I've always been interested in impressing my parents and siblings and wife about how a high annotation could be used outside of the sort of traditional, you know, uh, area of, uh, you know, annotation and close reading. Um, and so I want to start by asking the panelists sort of that, like, you know, how is annotation not just for the, human, for the humanities, right? Because I get that question from a lot of institutions as well. Um, why is annotation, why is reading, why is close reading um, important uh, in the sciences uh, as well? And maybe we can start uh, with you, Jennifer. So I think that a lot of times people come into science thinking, oh, we get to be independent and we get to just do our own thing. And I think that's often the perception of students as well, but that's not really how it works, right? So um, collaboration around text is something that happens in lab group settings. Um, it happens informally uh, over lunch and over coffee, right? So we're used to reading papers and gaining information in that way. Um, reading the the science of our uh, of our field and then talking about it with others and I would say that texts are, are foundationally important for what I do as an ecologist and plant biologist. Uh, that's super interesting Jennifer I especially like how you started off with saying you know people think they can do their own thing in science and I, I certainly frame it the same way when I talk about uh, annotation in the humanities right it's not a just it, there's there's a conversation that precedes you right um, and no construction of knowledge can uh, can begin without some attention to that conversation that precedes you and engaging with that conversation that precedes you. So I especially like that piece of what you said. Allison, you have anything further to add? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with Jennifer that that it's science is very much collaborative. Um, and uh, I think that annotation, collaborative annotation is a really great way to show that to students, um, to show the, the collaborative nature of this. Um, I also think it's just absolutely wonderful for um, I guess demonstrating to students how the the it's totally normal to sit down with something to sit down with a scientific paper and to have that discomfort of I have no idea what this is about. Um, and that discomfort is normal and and that's how it's supposed to be when you're reading a new paper. Otherwise, there wouldn't be a reason to read it if you already knew everything. Um, and so I love being able to use the collaborative annotation process as a way of showing students um, making that confusion visible, um, but then also using it as a way to collectively work through that confusion. Um, that it's okay to have that discomfort and here's how we can work through it. Here's how we can get stuck on something and not understand a concept and, and that, that process of working through it and making sense of it that's normally very invisible and very solitary. Um, I love how this sort of allows us to, to do that collaboratively or collectively. Wow, we're gonna have to steal some of the lines from that. Uh, response for our marketing materials. I love the uh, making confusion visible, um, working through that confusion, this idea that you're, uh, you know, you're not alone. It's not necessarily a solitary uh, practice. 
Um, let's let's dig in there a little bit um, because you know part of what I you know we do in the humanities when we're close reading and annotating um, is developing certain literacy li literacy skills, right? So uh, if I'm teaching a poem, I'm going to be asking students to uh, really break down the component parts of that poem, understand the devices and concepts and illusions that might go into um, into the creation of this work of art. Um, and so in the sciences, and maybe we can start with you and go the other way this time, Allison, you know, what are the, you know, where does the confusion come up? What types of, you know, what is, what is the, what are the objects or the artifacts within a document um, where confusion comes up and where certain literacies need to be developed for, um, for students that are, you know, entering college level science uh, courses? Yeah, I think that honestly, the, the most obvious answer here, but the one that really comes up a lot is jargon, right? There's, we, we you can call it jargon, you can call it terminology. Um, it's the, the, it's really common in scientific literature. Um, and even in, in the sort of pop science articles that I use a lot of those at, um, at sort of intro level courses, it's really common for students to, for any reader to stumble across something that you just, you don't have the background knowledge. This isn't something you're familiar with. Um, and so it's, it's, I think, really helpful to um, be able to annotate through that jargon um, and to indicate how you, where you found information. When I have, um, uh, when I ask students to make those types of annotations, I always have them cite the source for where they got the information. And so it's also a way of showing the, using your external resources, but then also in science, it's always important that you, you cite your sources. So students are citing sources in annotations? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. Cool. They have to. If they're if they're adding if they're adding information to an annotation that comes from elsewhere, that's not just their personal knowledge. They have to indicate where that information came from. It doesn't have to be a formal citation, but sure. a, a link or something like that. But so they're sort of uh, practicing scientific literacy and performing scientific literacy simultaneously. That's that's cool. Um, Jennifer, anything to add here about sort of what is it that we're annotating in the sciences? What kind of literacies are we developing? So one of the things that I add or some kind of meta textual information about what's actually being done in the paper at the different points. So sometimes when you read a paper uh, in science, it can be practically unintelligible, right? And it, it seems like there may not be method to the madness. So trying to call out to students, okay, you know, this is what they're doing here. They're trying to set the stage or they're trying to highlight gaps in knowledge. Um, information like that. I also use a uh, hypothesis to provide encouragement along the way because there are some parts of the paper where you read through it and you think oh my gosh that was horrible right like that made no sense whatsoever so uh i will seed annotations with like i know this is confusing skim this keep going you know or read for the big picture here and keep going because i think there are some students um, who get to those really tough places and they do one of two things. They either double down and they spend 45 minutes reading two paragraphs, which is not helping them, or they get to that spot and they think, oh my gosh, this is horrible, I'm done. And neither one of those are helping us kind of practice the process of science. So just kind of encouraging them to get through the tough places I think has been helpful. So what are we actually annotating here? What are we attaching hypothesis to in your courses? What types of documents? So Jennifer, let's start with you. What are students so actually annotating? It depends on what type of course I'm teaching. So for upper level courses like juniors or seniors, uh, we're actually annotating peer reviewed literature. Um, when I taught a freshman level course that's supposed to be interdisciplinary um, in what's called our core program, um, we were, I think we did one scientific paper there. We were reading other things, sometimes um, chapters out of books, sometimes pop science, sometimes news articles. And I used hypothesis for anything that I thought the students would need some extra support for, um, whether that be encouragement from their peers or things that might be a little bit confusing. What about you, Allison? What are they actually annotating? Many of the, the same types of um, readings that Jennifer has listed here. Um, uh, so scientific articles. Um, and, and as she said, you know, I think that the, with scientific articles and upper level courses, it's incredibly helpful for helping students work through the how do we read one of these papers. Um, but also at the, at the, the um, intro level courses, it's really, it really helps to make them more accessible by preceding them. 
Um, I also often use um, news articles and pop science articles that are some um, application of whatever technical details we were learning that week, um, a way that an environmental issue is coming up in the news, um, an editorial, something like that. Um, this semester, so this isn't something I've done yet, but I'm really excited to, um, this fall semester, I'm going to be using an open access textbook. And so I plan to, um, since we'll be teaching remotely, or since I'll be teaching remotely, um, I'm actually um, hoping to, to use the annotations to deliver a lot of the asynchronous course content. And so much of the course content will be living in the margins. Um, so I'll be annotating with the information that I would normally be providing in a lecture. Um, so links to videos of, of demos, me doing demos, um, explanations of things, links to other sources, places where they can watch a short visualization of something. Um, so the, the textbook piece will be new to me this semester, but I'm excited about that. I've also used, um, uh, used this for governmental reports, like the IPCC reports, um, the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, helping students work through those, watching students work through those. I, I keep saying helping students, but really in many cases, it's not me helping them, it's them working through it together with each other. Well, that's cool. I like the idea of annotating uh, government reports uh, with students. Um, I want to just follow up on that, Allison, because I think, you know, maybe, you know, people in the margins of the, of the uh, video uh, conferencing here in the chat uh, might have annotations to add to the conversation. I don't know if people can unmute, but um, this idea and well, first of all, what textbook, do you know what textbooks you're using, what the source is, because, um, you know, people might find that interesting if they're interested in bringing in open textbooks open resources and uh, following this lead, but you kind of made a shift there, right? Because previously we've been talking about student annotation um, and this new assignment you're thinking of is instructor, uh, instructional annotation preceding, uh, you know, preceded into a textbook or content before the students arrive, which sounds like a brilliant idea. What textbook are you using? Um, and maybe talk a little bit more about the kinds of content you're thinking about inserting in there to guide students as they encounter this text? Yeah, so um, the, the course that I'll be teaching this fall is a course called Sustainable Earth, and it's an intro level geology course. And it's, um, to be honest, finding a good textbook for this course is something that I've struggled with for a couple of years here now, because it's sort of an environmental geology course, but it has um, also a lot of uh, the sustainability emphasis that's not always covered in those textbooks. So I've often had to cobble together a couple of different resources. Um, and for better or for worse, that's, that's actually gonna work pretty well here by doing an open access textbook. Um, I'm pulling chapters from a couple of different ones. Um, and so some of those are physical geology textbooks at the beginning of the semester where we talk about setting the stage, Earth's cycles, plate tectonics, how that drives climate. Um, I'll be using uh, more sort of traditional physical geology textbooks for that, but then moving more into um, the sustainability side of things and some a, a, a number of different sustainability textbooks. So, um, uh, sorry, this is a, a long answer to a short question. Not just one textbook, um, but by doing it this way, I can sort of pull chapters from a variety of different ones. And you anticipate going in and helping, uh, you know, like elucidate a concept with a video, th that kind of thing? Yeah, so normally, um, you know, in a, in a traditional teaching, face-to-face -face setting, there would be some technical reading before class. And then, and then in class time, I would be talking about these concepts in more detail. And, and I always have students do something in class. It's not just me talking about stuff. Um, and so they would be doing hands-on demos. We'd be looking at short video clips. We'd be talking through stuff together. They'd be poring over a big piece of paper and sketching stuff out together. Um, and so the, the prompts for those types of things, I'm hoping to have them live in the annotations and the little, as you're reading through a section, the piece that I would talk about in class, instead I'll put in an annotation with a little video of me talking about that, or like I said, doing some demo and showing something or a link to another resource um, to, to uh, sort of supplement that in animation or something like that. Very cool. And I'm seeing something in the chat that I kind of want to bring in here. You're talking about creating multimedia annotations for your students in the margins of your textbooks. That's awesome. Um, do either of you ever use, ask students to do anything besides write with text? I mean, you mentioned links, Allison, um, but Jennifer, have you ever thought about images or video or do students use images or video or links in different ways in annotations for your uh, course? Well, they're a pretty tech savvy bunch. So some of them figure out along the way that, you know, they can do a lot more than just write. So in the past, I haven't explicitly asked them to use multimedia, 
Um, but I think I will be talking it up more uh, this coming fall to encourage them to do that because we do a lot of things in the course that are image based. And I think this would be a way to connect back to some of that other content, uh, as well as other things that they're running into. Anything to build on that, Allison? You touched upon this a little bit, but do you ever have students explicitly use images and video in their annotations or see them doing it naturally themselves? I've, I've encouraged them to do so. Um, and every so often a student will throw in an annotation with sometimes a song or I've had a student throw in like a music video that had something that was that was tangentially related. And I just really love the idea as we're reading through things of going down wormholes, frankly. Um, mm -hmm. And I really encourage students to do that in their annotations. I think that it it's um, I think that there's this uh, tendency to kind of compartmentalize science, right? Science with sort of capital S to compartmentalize it and not see the applications of it. And so I really love it when students use annotations, not just with text, but with multimedia to, to really um, find these different connections and find these different wormholes. Um, I've had some students that have annotated with memes, which has always been enjoyable as well. Oh, that's so awesome. I love this idea of like, go, you know, going down a wormhole and almost making that like an explicit instruction, like find a wormhole in this article and, and go down it, you know, some create a meme for it or find some pop culture reference to, to the concept. You know, I, I thought about um, that we should be playing that they might be giant so song science is real as the, at the beginning of this po uh, little podcast, whatever we call this, the show, I think is what we call it internally. Um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to my wife here in this conversation of multimedia annotation because she, uh, long ago when I was working at Rap Genius uh, with collaborative annotation and experimenting with the science classroom, she had students annotating uh, academic science articles. And I'm going to drop in a link to a, an assignment she wrote a long time ago um, that was for Genius and sort of has been divorced of its, uh, the specificity of the tool and also of the specificity that this originated in science. But she had students annotate in scientific uh, articles and she's an expert in frog song. So she had students annotate in an article um, about uh, you know, frog vocalizations. Um, and you know, part of what the students did, and I, I think it was built into the assignment, was to um, uh, uh, you know, add images of the frog, right? Or the YouTube videos of the frog song. And I remember one, the funny story from that uh, anecdote is that at some point somebody found uh, the, f the frog song, the frog calls remix to like Panamanian discotheque music because it was a you know, Panamanian frog. Um, so anyway, that kind of stuff, I don't, I don't mean to, it sort of brings the, brings the text to life and brings science to life in, in, in certain ways, I think. Um, but I love that idea of, of wormholes. Um, could you each talk about how you introduce uh, you know, an, an annotation assignment? I'm a student in your course. Um, I have a reading. And do you give students either at the beginning of the course to talk about uh, the role of hypothesis generally, or you could think about a specific, like when I do this particular article, these are the, you know, this is the prompt. Can you talk, get sort of drilled down into how you introduce students annotations or um, a particular annotation activity? Uh, that you've uh, had students uh, perform? And let's start with Jennifer since Allison talked last. <laughs> so um, I actually start with an activity that I believe I stole from Allison, which is I have them annotate my syllabi. So um, I give them a syllabus and I say, you know, we're going to be using this annotation software um, throughout the semester. So please go and check it out and annotate the syllabus you know, make some comments just so they have a low stakes way of um, experimenting with things and seeing, seeing what it's like. Um, and then from there, we start going into annotating, annotating papers. But it is, um, it's something that I kind of frame as part of a larger building of a scholarly community within the course. So I try to have a lot of inter interdependent work that happens um, and build in community there, not just via group projects, right? Like, okay, there's one group project that you have to do during the course of the semester, but really building a community of scholarship. So I talk about annotation as being part of how we do that. That's great. And of course we have uh, scholars and scientists outside of uh, formal, uh, you know, uh, teaching contexts that are using hypothesis for lab groups and for collaboration uh, across, uh, you know, scientific uh, publications. Allison, anything to add here? 
Uh, well, I'll just, I'll, I'll say here that um, the annotating the syllabus, I stole that idea from someone else. I think that was a, a Remy Collier has a, a great, um, a great writing online about that. And um, uh, so that wasn't, that wasn't something that I came up with my own. Um, but I really also love that. And I, I start every semester with that, with annotating the syllabus. Um, and uh, as Jennifer said, I think it's a great sort of entry into the, the process of annotation. I also really like it because students flag things on the syllabus that are um, either if there's any sorts of confusion on there, but but um, more interestingly to me is when they flag things that are interesting to them, um, topics that they're already a little bit invested in, um, or topics that relate to, uh, again, the wormholes, right? They're pulling in other courses that they've taken, things that this reminds me of something else that I've seen. Um, and so I love being able to have that at the beginning of the semester because then I can kind of view, I know which topics they're already invested in. Um, and so building from those syllabus annotations has been really helpful with then um, kind of not necessarily choosing the topics, but choosing the direction that we might go with some of the topics based on um, comments that they've made. I want to uh, double down on my question though, because I love the annotation, the syllabus assignment, but you know, what am I, what are you asking students to do? Um, are there things you're asking them to look for um, when you're reading scientific literature, whether it's pop or scholarly? Um, you know, what practices are they meant to be enacting? How are, you know, are they supposed to ask questions? Are they supposed to define terms? Um, what kind of direction do you give them in terms of like, well, what am I supposed to do with the annotations? This is a cool tool. I like being able to comment on the syllabus. What am I actually supposed to be doing when I'm reading this article and, and writing annotations that you may or may not be grading? Um, uh, Allison, let's start with you. Okay, yeah, so, so you asked, you know, are they supposed to write questions? Are they supposed to, uh, the answer to all of those is yes. They, I, I encourage them to do all of those things. I, the, the guidance that I give, I give them a couple of examples um, of, of annotations from other courses, from previous, previous annotations, um, but I encourage them to, an annotation should just add, it should add something substantive. It should be additive. Um, it should be constructive, it should be substantive, it should be additive, it should be whichever of these modifiers you'd like to use. Um, and so that can often be a explanation of here's a word, I didn't know what it meant, here's a link, I found it, or this was interesting to me and I wanted to know more about it, I went here. Um, uh, it's, 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 sort of, it's adding content um, in any way that they feel is additive, I guess. I, that's a little recursive, sorry. No, that's great. Jennifer, anything, do you define additive in any way or direct what additive means in any way? Or do you have another way that you prompt students in terms of like, well, what am I supposed to do, uh, professor, in my annotations on this reading? So I agree that the, the answer to your question was yes, all of the above. Um, I tell them that I'm looking for something that shows me they have meaningfully engaged with the text. So for some students who want to check boxes, this can be frustrating, right? Because it's like, well, what do you want? Um, but I think one of the strengths of the annotation software is that there are multiple ways to approach this and to be successful um, in the annotation, right? There's not just one way to do it and that they can do a variety of things, right? And they don't have to do the same thing every time, right? Like if, they, if they're primarily a question asker on one text, they can be a question answer on the next, right? It doesn't mean that they have to play a specific role the entire time. So like Allison, I give them examples, right? And then in class, um, if we meet face to face, then I will pull out questions or points of confusion or really good observations that were made uh, in the margins and then talk about that in the class. Um, if you're all online, then I try to come back after the fact and make some comments about things that students have written but I do try to wait a little bit on that. So I will often precede an annotation, but then I will let the conversation kind of evolve because I don't want it to be, here are these interesting things that people have said and then I as a professor come in, oh yeah, great, here, look at this, check this out, right? I want the students to actually be having that conversation amongst themselves. So I will give them, you know, sometimes a couple of days, sometimes, you know, over a week before I come back in to kind of mop up and resolve any any issues that might be still lingering there. I love that. Um, well, I don't know if either of you have sort of something that you were hoping to share that I haven't been able to draw out with a question, uh, or if uh, Franny has seen anything in the uh, margin of the video chat that, uh, that we want to surface here for the group. Um, 
I think this is an amazing, this has been an amazing conversation and provides a lot of, you know, uh, help to folks who might be starting with uh, annotation in the science classroom. Um, Franny, is there anything you want to bring out? There's a recent question, how do you get students to return to the annotated text later to see what others have added? I think that's an interesting question to ask. Um, Allison, if you want to start. Sure, yeah, so that was that was actually uh, one other thing that I, I, I think is always interesting when I hear about other people using hypothesis. Um, I, I like to hear you know, what they have the students doing, but then also like, what do you do with what the students do? What do you do with the annotations after they're there? And you know, Jennifer just talked about sort of coming in afterwards, and I like the idea of the, the mop up afterwards. Um, but the, one of the courses that I taught this past semester, um, it was a small course. And so what I would do is their annotations at the end of the week, um, Friday's class was basically going through a, usually a pop science article, some application, and using their annotations to kind of guide the story arc of our class. So working our way through the article with the, the story arc created by their annotations. Um, and so with that, I would have the document pulled up in class and we would work through them together. And so in that case, the students were returning to the annotations collectively, all of us together. Um, and then at the end of the semester, um, because we were surprisingly online and um, I wanted to do something very different for the final exam. I like the idea of a finale rather than a final. And so I had them return to their annotations, um, to each annotated article um, for their final exam and find an annotation and respond to it in such a way to demonstrate how their, how their understanding of something has evolved over the course of the semester. And so um, in that case, they were returning to the annotations at the end of the semester and, and going through all of them that way. Well, and, and before Jennifer jumps in on, on talking about how to you know, bring students back to the, uh, to the text, I will say thanks to Anna for asking a question in the Q&A part of the uh, Zoom. That's a great place to surface because you know, Nate is in the chat talking about Mickey Mouse, which is distracting me. So if you really have a question for the panelists, um, you might put it in the Q&A um, and then that, that'll be easier for us to surface it. Uh, Jennifer, any strategies um, for bringing students back to the text? So when we made the pivot to online, I explicitly asked them to go back and re-engage with a couple of questions that I had flagged. So after students would read the text before class, uh, I would go in and I would mark questions that I thought were especially provocative, uh, ones for which there's not a clear answer, right? Um, that people could really go back and forth on. So then I marked those and then the students were um, asked to come back in and, you know, pick two questions and kind of follow up with those. Uh, another thing that I did with these to kind of encourage students to, to go back and read the annotations was that students were responsible for being kind of in charge of a paper, right? So presenting that in some way to their peers, helping lead discussions. And they were instructed to use the annotations. So as a group, we decided when the annotations would be due, right? So you should be completed by you know, 5 p.m. the night before. And this would kind of be like a brain trust for the students who were presenting and they could rely on those annotations for the discussion questions if they needed to or for understanding the paper so that there was kind of this iterative process. Because I agree that I think it is hard, um, especially for the students who are maybe really quick to go in and annotate, you know, you don't want them to always just be the first person and the first voice, right? You want them to be able to come back and see what's going on and what has developed since they read it. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, we well, have a couple more. Oh. Let me just follow up on that real quick with Jennifer for a second, Franny. Sure. Um, so Jennifer, you mentioned this a couple of times. So I'm just gonna be a literary snob for just a minute and, and needle you in. This is a straw man thing, but I, I want you to uh, sort of perform this for our, for our listeners. Um, you've mentioned conversation or discussion or debate, right? And a couple times and sort of students going back and forth and, and, and debating something. And, you know, so obviously that happens in art and in literature. Like, why does that happen in science? And what context does that happen in science, right? I mean, it's science, right? You should wear a mask. That stops the virus, right? And the conversation. There shouldn't be a debate. Like, so, like, what, what, if, what are folks going back and forth about? What is that debate discussion? So talk to me about the discursive aspect of reading scientific literature. 
So that's a great question. We actually debate things all the time in science. And um, I was talking earlier about kind of meta reading of texts. And I think that this is a lot of what happens in the introduction of papers. So in higher level courses, I talk about this explicitly, right? That we have this conversation between what has happened historically, what are the different ideas about why something happens or how it happens, right? And you have, you know, this view that says it works like this. And then another view came, came along and we said, no, no, it works this other way. And this kind of back and forth is really uh, integral to the process of how we do science. So I think talking more about that um, is, important, is important in the classroom because I think that a lot of people do have this idea, right, that you said that, you know, it, it just is, right? Science just is but it really is this long conversation over time. It is, um, it is truly a process. Um, I, think, I think it was Carl Sagan who said that science is a way of thinking um, much more than it is a body of knowledge. So trying to model that thinking in the margins, I think is an important thing for our students. That's awesome. Allison, anything to add there? No, I, I, think, that I think Jennifer summed it up really well. You don't want to upstage Carl Sagan? <laughs> no, I don't. I'm not going to. Nope, not going to not going to try that one. <laughs> uh, Franny, sorry to interrupt you before, but I, I sense an opportunity to have an interesting conversation there about that. Oh, particular no point. problem at all. No, I'm always for that. Um, we do have a couple more questions and we have a bit more time. So um, I want to get to those. Um, and thank you to those of you who actually answer other people's questions. That's great. Um, can you talk about your assessment process for annotation assignments? Do you give students a rubric for number and quality of annotations? So um, I do not give a rubric because I don't really want box checking, um, right? Like, okay, I asked a question, I defined a word, I'm done. Um, but I do try to do, to give a variety of, um, of feedback and grades on annotations. So uh, to begin with, I just had, if they didn't, if they only did like one annotation that was not really worth much, um, they didn't get a lot of credit for that. Now I'm, I'm starting to make that a pretty low, a low um, grade, but something there because zeros can really bring down averages, right? So I pretty much have like a, check plus, check, check minus type of system that corresponds to numbers. Um, and the idea is if you go in and you do kind of, you know, a mediocre job, but you've engaged with the text, you know, that would be the equivalent of a check. If you've really like obviously done some deep thinking about things or pulled out some important parts, then I give that a, a check plus. And if you clearly did not have enough time, but you did try and you put an annotation or two, you know, that would be a check minus. And I found that that gives room for improvement for students, but also tries to um, reward, you know, engaging even just a little bit, which I think is important, especially with COVID and all the things that can be going on in students' lives. I, so I, um, uh, I struggled with the same, the same types of things. Um, and Jeremy, you referenced the, the, the flybys, right? The students who just come in and annotate and then never look at it again. And, and, you know, Jennifer, you talked about the box checking in the first, I think the first year or two that I used hypothesis, I had given them a recommended number of annotations per week, you know, maybe three or five, what I called meaningful annotations. And I found that that led to a lot of box checking and flybys. Um, and so the past year I've removed the number of, of recommended annotations. I have still given them a rubric, but the rubric instead is of how to demonstrate meaningful engagement with the text, right? So um, it may be that somebody only puts in one or two annotations, but it's really obvious in those annotations that they have meaningfully engaged with this text. This person in this text, they have bonded, they have had deep thoughts about it, they've grappled with it and they show that. Um, and sometimes maybe the, the annotations don't do quite such a deep dive, but the student does sort of more, more coverage of the text and annotates in many different ways. Um, and so I, I do still give them a rubric, but it's more um, qualitative in showing that meaningful engagement. And then in the first two or three weeks, I give them very, very detailed feedback on their annotations and on the grade that they received um, as a way to, to hopefully set the bar high um, and give them something to strive for. That's great, thanks. I like that quality over quantity. Um, 
So um, there's a couple more questions. I really like this one. Um, it's about um, visiting annotators. So do you have, ever have anyone like say the author of an article come in and annotate their own article or that could be an article that you wrote as well, you know, that you're annotating? I have not, but that sounds like a great idea. Uh, I would love to do that. So I'll put that on my to-do list for the fall because I think that could be really, uh, really meaningful for folks. Yeah, sounds great. I, I, Thank you. Yeah, I agree. That's not something I've done yet, but I really, I do like the idea of that. I think it's, um, it's a really, it, that'd be awesome. Yeah. yeah, good luck getting Carl Sagan into uh, Colgate Moodle, but uh, outside the LMS, certainly that's a, a very cool idea. Yeah, really neat. Um, okay, and then, let's see, um, so is there an ideal group size for annotations that balances active engagement by individuals with critical mass and range of perspectives? So I've used hypothesis in classes as small as, it was an independent study with two students, um, uh, and then I had a small course this past semester with six students and I've used it up to courses that had 25 or 26 students. Um, honestly, I really loved the way that it played out in the six person class last semester. Um, the students were, they knew each other well by the end of the semester. There was a lot of um, dialogue happening, a lot of conversation. Um, and, and I really liked that a lot. Um, but I haven't always had the luxury of being able to do that. And um, I found that even with 25 or 26 students, um, it's, I still feel like there's meaningful engagement that's happening there and meaningful interactions between them. I've done this with small groups of about 10 or 11, um, maybe up to 12. I'm considering splitting it in half because I think that'll promote more accountability. Um, and then maybe shuffling those groups halfway through the semester so that people can work with different folks. Um, but we'll see. I haven't, I haven't yet uh, worked all that out logistically. Okay. Um, great. And then I think this question, we did talk about it, but it keeps coming up. So maybe we should talk about it a little bit more. When assigning primary literature, do you have them annotate the HTML or the PDF version, or does it matter? I've always preferred to go with PDFs just because I've had too many issues with HTML, with links breaking. Um, you know, you set up everything at the beginning of the semester and then by week 14 of the semester, something has moved, something has changed. Um, and so I prefer to use PDFs for that reason. But I, um, I used to host the PDFs online, but now with the LMS integration, I host the PDFs on Moodle and, and have it run through there. Same here, I do the PDFs. Okay, great. Um, and we still have a little bit of time. Does anybody have any other questions, um, including uh, our hypothesis people here today, Jeremy and Nate? And I suppose if I could think of a, an intelligent question right now, I would ask one myself. <laughs> I, <can't. laughs> I did want to address, sorry, this is Nate jumping in. I did want to address one a uh, question that came in a lot earlier, or it was really an idea and a suggestion, which was that it would be great if there were a collection of annotation assignments and exercises and practices. Um, the person who put it in uh, suggested it in biology, but I just, I answered in chat, but I wanted to make it clear that um, we see this as a real need. And so hypothesis is kind of in the final stages of preparing uh, a way to collect annotation practices across all the disciplines, but then also be able to view and sort them by discipline. And so because you registered for this um, webinar, we'll send you an email. That is, if you don't mind us sending you email uh, about uh, when that collection uh, is ready. And so we'll both invite you to, to populate it with your ideas, as well as you'll be able to browse and search other people's ideas. So that's, that's coming up. And I just want to add that if there are folks here uh, who don't yet haven't gotten started with Hypothesis yet uh, and are you know, interested in, in using Hypothesis this fall, uh, please reach out to us at, at education at Hypothesis and we can help you get set up. Um, there may be a bit of a process if we're working to get it into your uh, LMS at your school, but we are offering a free pilot of the LMS integration through 
um, the end of the, of the calendar year. Um, so it's a great opportunity for you and your colleagues and your institution to, to get involved in uh, exploring hypothesis and collaborative annotation for teaching and learning. Also just want to give a quick shout out to my mom and dad um, and my brothers and sisters. Again, they're all scientists and so I'll probably send them the link to this at some point. I just wanted to say hi mom. I just want to say this has been such a great show and thank you to our guests. Thank you to everyone who attended and to Jeremy Dean and Nate Angel.